Hi, I'm Pastor Don Cherry of the Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And we're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for our worship service. We're hoping that it'll be a blessing to you, be an encouragement to you, and even a little bit of a challenge to you as we look into the Word of God together. So I hope that you'll follow us, have your Bible out, and all join in with us and join us as we go into the Word of God this morning. May it be a blessing to you. Amen. I mean, that's about all you can get. Amen. You know, I, again, I've said it before when Tim and Suzette here, I love when the plan comes together and they talk, talk and sing about the greatness of God, you know, and we're going to look into that this morning, but our series title, and we're going to go to Revelation chapter four in your Bibles this morning. Our series that we're kind of piggybacking with what we're going through in Sunday school, uh, Dr. David Jeremiah teaching via DVD that way, but we're looking at the believer's hope from the rapture to the millennial, from the rapture to the millennial. We understand that rapture as being the next prophetic event to take place according to the word of God, but I think a lot of times we don't think of what is going to happen to us as believers once that takes place. The Bible is full about what's going to take place here on the earth during the tribulation period, but what about us? What do we have to look forward to? And that's kind of what we're dealing with here over the next couple of weeks with this, but what I want to understand, especially when we go into our lesson today and everything, we, let's grab a hold of this, folks, that our hope, our hope is not in the Republican Party. Do we understand that? Amen. Our hope is not in the Green New Deal that's going to save the planet or whatever like that. Our hope is not in all the social reforms that we want to see politician, politicians do. Our hope is in the person of Jesus Christ. And just like Dr. Jeremiah talked about this morning and everything, this is a world of darkness. This is a world of people who are seeking, and they're seeking because they can't find their way. They don't know where they're going. If you've ever been in absolute total darkness, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, I'm talking about from a spiritual aspect. But Christ, is the light of the world. And he has given us that light that we might be an example, that we might be a testimony and a witness to those who are seeking, to those who are without. And I want us to understand that this morning. Look, as believers, don't get me wrong, we need to be good citizens, okay? I'm not talking about that. We need to vote. We need to be in contact with those who represent us. We need to stand firm upon the principles of God, but more than anything, we need to realize our hope is in Christ. All right? He is our hope. And just like what we've seen here, throughout the entire Word of God, He is. You know, Jesus doesn't just show up in the Gospels. He is there in Revelation as the Creator and all. He is there in Genesis, the mighty God, you see. He is there and all. Let's not forget that, that He is all through the, 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 the word of God that he has given us. So in Revelation chapter 4, I dealt last week very quickly with just the first couple of verses, so I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on that a whole lot, but uh, I did ask a question last week about, you know, have you ever stopped and thought about heaven? What is your concept of heaven? Now, I know how Hollywood has shown us, you know, and such as like that. And, you know, I, I also got to find out when you look into the scriptures, I can't find a description of heaven. I can find a description of the new Jerusalem that came down from God out of heaven. But as far as heaven, the abode of God, there's not a descriptive place that I can find. And please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not saying that I know all that in the scriptures. But what is your concept of it? Is your concept of it clouds? Angels on a cloud with a heart? You know, there may be a lush green valley and a, a river flowing through it. You know, what, what's your concept of heaven? We don't know, okay? We don't have anything to reference that point. But it's kind of like I told you here, you know, on a number of occasions and everything, I really don't care what heaven's like, to be honest with you. It doesn't make me any difference, whether it's a green, lush valley, whether it's a brown desert. Whether, I don't care. As long as Jesus is there, I can care less. Because that's what's important. And all the Bible tells us that we as believers, we will be with him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen? Is that right? Shall we ever be with the Lord? 
So let's look here just the first couple of verses. And uh, Revelation chapter 4 is only 11 verses, so we're going to get through that entire chapter. But if you'll notice the first couple of verses there. Now after this, okay, like I said, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit because of last week. After this, after the church age, all right, because that's what took place in Revelation 2 and 3. So John is in reference to that. After the church age, which the church age ends with the rapture, okay? It ends with the rapture of the church, believers in Jesus Christ. So he says, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now that's going to be my springboard into the message this morning. So I want you to understand what is happening here. John is a type of the New Testament bride. Now, John was a real literal person, okay? Uh, John was the only one of Jesus' apostles that did not die a martyr's death. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos and all, and toward the end of the first century is when God gave him the revelation and offered him the pen and write down, which we are reading from today. So John is on the Isle of Patmos. He tells us that back in chapter 1. But John also represents in type the New Testament church or the bride of Christ. Now you might say, what is a type? Okay, a type is somewhat of a physical picture of a greater spiritual truth. Okay, or even a person. Paul. So uh, let me give you an example of that. Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark is a type of Christ. You say, how in the world can a boat be similar to Christ? Well, consider what that boat was, all right? First of all, you know, it, it, it was made out of acacia wood, which is a very common wood. The Bible says that Christ would be a root out of dry ground. Similarity there. Also in that ark, there was only one way of entrance. Now, we live in a pluralistic society and a pluralistic culture, Paul. Well, we have many religions, and all those religions say there's different paths to heaven, don't they? Okay, you go your path, I'll go mine, such as like that. But if we look into the Word of God, and the Word of God is true, it is the Word of God, the Bible says there's only one way. Amen. There is no other name given among men than the name of Jesus Christ that would be saved. And even Jesus said, I am the way, in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. All right? So we see that the only way that we have for heaven and to be in the presence of the Father is through the person of Jesus Christ and our faith and trust in Him. All right? We get that. Okay? So there's only one door into the ark. There's only one way to safety. Because what was an ark? Ark, that ark, and I'll protect it, knowing his family literally from the judgment of God. Because the flood was the judgment upon the sin of the world. All right? It was a judgment. And God provided this ark and everything for Noah and his family and the animals to go into. And there they found safety from the judgment of God. How do we find safety from the judgment of God? Through the person of Jesus Christ. It's not through your church membership. It's not through your baptism. It's not through being a good person. It is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? So John, here in Revelation chapter 4, represents us. Okay, he represents the bride of Christ, the New Testament church. And we see what happened here. We see that a door was open, a trumpet talking with me. Where, where, where is the familiarity of the trumpet? Remember 1 Thessalonians 4? The trump of God will sound. All right. And so we see here the voice that said, come up hither. Okay. Come up hither. Okay. Rapture. Snatched. Okay. To be with the Lord. <laughs> see. And notice. It said that immediately I was in the spirit and I was before a throne. Now here's the thing. Okay? John has given us a description of what you and I are going to see when we're taken out of here. When the Lord comes, what we're going to see. And I want you to notice we're not going to see tall buildings. Okay? We're not going to see crystal flowing rivers. We're not going to see green and lush valleys. We're going to see a person. 
we're going to see one who is sitting on the throne. And John here is raptured into the presence of the eternal. Now let's look at how John describes the one sitting on the throne. Beginning in verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had their heads, on their heads, crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was a flying eagle. Now I want to stop right there for just a moment, okay? And we're going to kind of break that down just a little bit so we see not what John is seeing, but who John is seeing, okay? Who John has been brought into the presence of. Now the visage there we see he is described with Jasper and Sardian, okay? Now, we've got to go back into the Old Covenant for just a moment. The high priest on his vesture and everything had 12 different stones that were sewn into that vesture. Each one of those stones represented a tribe of Israel. There were 12 tribes, right? So each tribe had stone that was sewn into the vesture of the high priest. That Jasper stone and all was the first one. And then the Sardin stone or an emerald was the last. Okay? First and last. What does that remind you of? Yeah, you're saying it, Terry. And are they exactly right? How did Jesus describe himself? I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay? You see that? And so the Jasper, which was representative of the tribe of Reuben, means, Reuben means behold a son. Behold a son. Now listen, this is very important to catch this. The emerald, which represented the tribe of Judah, Judah means son of my right hand. So here we see by this first and last stone, what's the common denominator there? Son. Son. You see? You see what I'm getting at? So what do we see here? What is John seeing? As he has been raptured and he is standing before this throne and there's a person on that throne, who is he looking at? He's looking at Jesus. He's looking at the eternal Son. Okay? He is looking at Christ. Okay? The one who called him there. So now notice, there are 24 elders that are around this throne. And if you'll notice how they are, they are clothed, first of all, in white raiment and then crowns of gold. White gold. What do we see, see here? These 24 elders represent the redeemed of all ages. The redeemed of all ages. Old Testament, New Testament saints re represents each one of them. It represents the 12 tribes of Israel, the Old Covenant, the 12 apostles of the New Covenant. This is representative of all believers that are now around this throne. And they're worshiping. They're worshiping the one that is on that throne. How do we know they're worshiping? Over in verse 8, that's all you have to look at. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Man, that's the song of worship. We're going to look at that here in just a little bit. But if you'll notice also, there were seven lamps, okay? Now, again, I hope you're, I hope you're grasping on this description, Hope, okay? The number seven represents what? Completion, okay? It's the number of God, okay? It's the number of completion. It's the number of perfection in biblical numerology, all right? So here we see seven lamps. Lamps are light, and also we are seeing perfect light. Perfect light is the number of completion, and this is none other than the Rosh HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? The Spirit of God. You say, well, Christ, God, Spirit, they're all different, right? No, three in one. The Trinity. So John is viewing literally the eternal visage of the eternal God. 
when he sees that. When he first when he comes in, when he's first taken up, he sees the eternal God. But here's something I want you to grab a hold of. Notice there's a sea of glass. Now that sea of glass is indicative of during the time of the temple, there was a bronze labor that was there in the courtyard. Okay? That labor, labor was for washing. It was a symbol of washing. But also that bronze was reflective. Okay? It was reflective. So whoever would look into that, they would see themselves. How many of you have ever been, you know, where, where water is really crystal clear and everything, and you bend over, you look, and you see your reflection? Have you ever seen that before? Yeah, you, you see it. So that, that, that's what's happening here. You know, they, they would they would, they would uh, look into that labor, and that labor would, dis, would disclose who they are. It would reveal who they are in every way. And it had to do with washing. And the Bible tells us that we are washed the water of what? The Word of God. The Word of God, this labor represents the eternal Word of God. It continues to wash, you see. We sing that old song, don't we? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? Okay? The washing of water, of the Word, you see. And here's the thing about the Word of God. We talked about it a little bit in Sunday school this morning. But the Word of God reveals who we are, doesn't it? You know, when we look into that labor, we see the reflection of ourselves. It reveals everything. I shared with Sunday school class and growing up uh, as a teenager, and maybe some of you have this um, uh, problem also, and I think how many of you, if you want to admit it, don't raise your hand if you don't, but how many of you, you, you as a teenager struggled with acne? I did. Man, I looked in the mirror every morning and everything, and I'd see those red dots, and I told our Sunday school class I'd probably cut uh, Clarisil in business. You know, because I got the, 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 the flesh colored, you know, I want to cover them up. You know, I'm going to school. Didn't want people to see my blemishes. You know, and after a while, they would clear up. See, that's what the Word of God does. It reveals the blemishes. But it also provides the healing, you see, when we abide by the Word of God. And Jesus Christ, of course, the Bible says, is the living Word of God. He is the living Word of God. And here's the thing about the scriptures, folks, that we got to get a hold of. I'm going to deal with something here real quickly. Tim, you might have heard, heard of this. I'm not sure. The Bible says that the Word of God is forever seven. In other words, what that means is that when you and I are gone, the Word of God's still here. It's not going anywhere. Okay, it's eternal. It's settled in the Word. Well, there is a movement, I guess you could say, within Christianity called deconstructionism. You heard it? Right? Called deconstructionism. And basically, now how many of you were children of the 60s? Okay, let me see. 60s, okay? Children of the 60s. All right, Kenny, you were children. Come on, get your hand up there. Right? I know, man. All right. The children of the 60s. Well, if you remember the mindset of the 60s, everything, it was down with the establishment. It was tear everything down. You know, home, everything, and everything. Think yourself. You know, do a question everything. You know, that was the mindset. You know, what we see back in the sixties. Well, deconstructionism is basically people are taking what they have been taught over the years in the church through through the Word of God, and they're questioning it. They're questioning it. They're tearing it down in so many ways. And the mind, the the idea is to have the scriptures fit what we believe. In other words, I believe this about the home. I believe this about salvation. I believe this about marriage. I believe this and all. Now we're going to get the scriptures to fit that. And folks, that's not the way it works. Amen. Okay? God's word doesn't change for us. We are to change for God's word. Amen. Okay? Because it's not going anywhere, right? right? It's going to be here. So you can sit back and say, my opinion, my preference, all that. Well, that's great, but if it doesn't match up to the word of God, it means nothing. Right. It's simply your opinion. All right? So the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It guides us through life. It reveals to us who God is, and it reveals to us our position before God and all in our need for our Savior. You see, because of sin. Now, I know none of you think you're sinners, okay? You know, we're just not. I mean, after all, look, we're, here we are. We're sitting in church on Sunday morning. How can we be sinners? But yet we are. And I don't know about you, 
Well, I find it every day. I find it every day. Amen. The Bible talks about the flesh lust against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, man. And the thing, it, it, it's a total war. It's a total war. My father-in-law used the illustration one time. You know, he grew up in the oil fields of West Texas and New Mexico. And so out there in the oil fields, they're all laid off and work with indigenous Indians. Because, you know, there's a lot of reservations that are out there in those areas. And he got to talking with an Indian. And I don't know if that's politically correct or not. What are we supposed to call them? Indigenous people? I, they're Indians. Okay? I'm from Ohio, Cleveland. And they're not the command. They're the Indians. Okay? I always do that way. So if you want to jump on me for it, that's fine. But he was talking with an Indian there. They got talking about spiritual things. That old Indian told him, he said, I got two dogs in me. Good dog, bad dog. And Dad, Dad asked him, he said, so which one wins out? He said, whichever one I feed. Right. Whichever one I feed. Folks, isn't that indicative of how we are today? You feed the flesh, guess, guess what's going to come to the top? Things in the flesh, but when you feed the spirit, okay, the spirit overcomes those things. And we have the big rule. We sing that song, Victory in Jesus. Amen. I'm my Savior forever. So here we see what John is seeing and the person of Jesus Christ. Now notice these four beasts. These four beasts, there are four characteristics here that literally represent the attributes of the living God. Now, some Bibles you might have beasts. Others might have living ones. You know? And according to H.A. Ironside, and all who is a long-time pastor of Moody Church and everything believes that living ones is the more accurate translation. And think so four living ones here representing the attributes of the living God. First of all, we see a lion, which represents divine majesty. How is the lion described? He is one in the jungle. Okay, let's try that again. How is the lion described? King. King of the jungle. Okay? King of the jungle. And all he rules that rain. Everything when he roars, other animals they notice that and everything strikes fear into them. The lion, representative of the king. Alright? So we see the divine majesty by this representation. And then the calf or the young ox is divine strength. Divine strength. You know, when we are weak, it's when Jesus is strong, isn't he? And when we feel like we can go on no more, when we have no strength to continue, we can find strength in Him. I'll have the strength to carry on, the old song says, in the person of Christ, you see. You know, He never runs low on strength. He never gets tired. He never gets weak. We can always rely on that. Then there is the face of a man, which is indicative of divine intelligence and purpose. Divine intelligence and purpose. Why? Because man is the highest of God's creation. Man is the image bearer of God. Man is the one that God formed into the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, you see. And through that now had the ability to relate and commune with his creator. And then the eagle. The eagle represents the divine swiftness detecting evil and executing judgment. Here's a real simple thing of that of the eagle. Don't think, ever think you can pull one over on God. Don't ever think you can pull one over on God. God sees everything. God hears everything. You see, God knows everything. He's on mission. He's all He knows these things. And when it comes to sin and evil and everything, He executes judgment. He detects that evil. And He is swift in dealing with it. And when I talk about that, you know, sometimes we think, you know, well, this has been going on for years. Keep in mind, God's time is not our time. All right? God's time is not our time. Right. You know, we, we, we are bound by minutes, hours, days, all that. God's not. God dwells in the eternal now. There's no yesterday. There's no tomorrow with God. It's just now, you see. God dwells in the eternal now. Now, notice there, verse 8. As they are singing, Night and day. They don't rest. They sing night and day saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Now go here. Which was and is and is to come. Who's that reference to? Who's coming back, folks? Okay, come on, wake up. Who's coming back? Jesus. Yeah. 
Exactly. Christ is coming back. So who's this indicative of notice which was, okay? Eternity past. God's always been. Which is right now. He dwells right now in the eternal now. But notice, is to come. Who tells us who, who's coming? According to the scripture, who's coming back? Christ, Revelation chapter 19. We saw it on there. And the revelation, who is he? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who comes back to establish his millennial kingdom. You see. This is what we have to look forward to, dear friend. As a believer today, where is your hope? Where does your hope lie? Man, if we can just make it to November, we'll see some, yeah, we'll see some things change, probably. But for how long? Yeah. You know? Hey, let's all get rid of our internal combustion engines and everything and go get that with batteries and everything and start driving. You know, that'll help the planet stay a little more greener. For how long? You see? For how long? Our hope is not in those things. I'm not saying it bad. I'm just saying our hope's not there. Yep. Our hope is in this one that John has seen that is on the throne. Now, drop down to verse 10 if you would for a moment. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Well, Pastor, listen, we're wrong here. I think God's the creator, not Jesus. Oh, really? Let's go over to Paul's writing and see what he says. Matter of fact, go to John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word could be God, right? Was God. And then you drop down a few verses and everything, you see that everything that was brought into existence came in according to his will. Who? Jesus. You see, who is God. This is who John sees on the throne. But now, verse 10 and 11 tells us that we believers who have come before that throne now have an eternal privilege. First of all, we are in His presence. We are in His presence. For eternity, we'll be in the presence of the one who gave His life for us. You know, just a few weeks off, as a matter of fact, three weeks, I think, if I'm not mistaken, everything is... Passover, Easter, right? Yeah. Where we commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. So what is that? Just a religious holiday? Just something where we get our daughters a cute little dress and everything and go get a bunch of Easter lilies and all? Which, Connie, we need to do that. And I'll put them here, okay? <laughs> Talk to my secretary here, folks. Doing a little business. But anyway. So is that what Easter is? Wow. It's for us to remember the one who gave himself for us. The one who died, the one who shed his blood, and everything. Why? Because of his sin? Because of his misgivings? Because of his blemishes? No, because of our sin. That without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And if Christ had given himself a ransom, then, dear friend, I want you to know something. There is absolutely no reason for us to be sitting here today. All we're doing is playing a religious shell game. But we are here today. Ask the redeemed because of the redeemer that gave himself for us. So we're going to be in his presence. Secondly, we're going to worship him. We're going to worship him. Now what's that going to look like? Because often worship is defined by, you know, time and place. Okay? I mean, we go to a church, they have a time of praise and worship. Okay? 15, 20, 25 minutes, whatever you know, the beginning, everything. We find worship, but what is worship? Worship is our soul's response to the Spirit. Okay? It's our soul's response to the Spirit. You know, the Bible says that God is a Spirit, and they that worship Him must do so in the pews with a piano. It's not what it says. It says, what's it say, Barbara? The Spirit and the truth, you see. The Spirit and the truth. And I'm not being critical of things, you know, whether it's uh, you know, some define worship by opening a hymn book and singing along to a piano organ. 
Others, you know, you go into a place and the auditorium is blacked out and you got the stage lights and smoke coming up from the stage and the men coming out and people down in front, you know, doing this and all that. You know, whatever. Whatever, you know, in that way. But I remember a fellow telling me that the place, the time that he's experienced the greatest worship with God was in a tree stand. In a tree stand. Because it was him and God. No distraction. No cell phone. No, no, no nothing. Out there in nature, enjoying the beauty of creation. And hoping that eight point bug would come along. But nonetheless, <laughs> up there in that tree stand, you see. And he said it was almost like Jesus was sitting right next to me. We were talking. Just that way. You see? So worship is not time, place, or settings. Worship is a heartfelt attitude and response to God. To serve. And however God leads. Listen, you, might, you can worship going down 81. You can pray going down 81 too, which you probably need to half the time. You can worship God. You can worship sitting in the backyard with a cup of coffee at 8 o'clock in the morning. You understand what I'm saying? That's what we're going to do. We're going to worship there. So we're going to worship for all eternity. And then notice, he said they cast the crowns before him. Where do the crowns come in? I'm glad you asked. You're going to have to come back in two weeks. Because that's what we're going to deal with, the judgment seat of Christ. That's where we see our reward. And we're going to look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that will bring us to the cusp of the return of Christ and the setup of his molecular kingdom. This is what we as believers all had to look forward to. That is where our hope is. That's where we are encouraged at. We're not encouraged by what's going on in this world. We see, according to the scriptures, that this world is going exactly what happens when you leave God out of the mix. But that's not our hope. Our hope is the one that John saw that sat on the throne. That's not other than the person. Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads? Well, folks, thanks for joining us in our live stream here from Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church in Stephen City, Virginia. And I trust that the message was an encouragement to your heart today. If you'd like to find out more about that ministry, or, you know, if there's something we can pray for you about or a spiritual question that we can answer, I want to encourage you to go to our website at svbcfamily.com. That's for Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church family.com. And just follow the prompts there and you can send your prayer request. You can send your question and everything. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. But as always, you're welcome to join us any Sunday at 1030 a.m., right here in uh, Stephen City, located right between Route 11 and I-81. So uh, come and see us sometime, but until then, I pray the Lord bless you, I pray the Lord keep you, and that the Lord shine his face upon you.